Now, what links Michael um, to our next speaker, Don Zeraldo, is that uh, Don, like Michael, and uh, I like to think like uh, City TV and Chum Television, are all engaged in creating Canadian content, uh, which we also want to put out there in the world. Uh, I call this Canadian cultural imperialism, and I say it's about time. Um, it's not given to many people to not only start a company, but to effectively start an industry, and that's what Don Zeraldo did here in Canada. And if today we drink Canadian wines and Ontario wines without apology, it's because of Don Zeraldo's work. He's also <clears throat> not a bad-looking guy. <laughs> you know, I remember you and I had lunch back in those days, and you had to leave. I picked up the tab, because you had to leave to go pick up some advertising dollars so you could go back to the station and pay the uh, staff. So. Yeah. <laughs> some of you, or most of you, know me as the wine guy. And, of course, when I was preparing for this, I was uh, going to stand up here and do an educational thing, talk about wine, the thing that I do all the time, you know, give you an education on wine. And actually, Jennifer and Moses were actually open to the idea of me passing around wine to do a wine tasting. Logistics didn't bother them. They said, great, we'll do it, no problem. There's only 500 people in here, and it shouldn't be a problem. We were going to pass around a specially designed Riedel ice wine glass that we did in a workshop with George Riedel from Austria. And then something happened on the way, on the way to the forum, I was going to say, on the way to Asia. A friend of mine sent me a book three or four days before called uh, Awakening the Buddha Within. I'm sure a few of you have read it. So as I was traveling over, I read it. It's a 12-hour flight. And then I thought to myself, you know, if you wanted to hear me talk about wine, you could do it any place. I just came back from the Aspen Food and Wine Classic. I did it there. I did it through Asia. I do it day and night. And I could do it very easily because that's what I do. That's what I've done for 20-some, 20 27 years. So I thought, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone. And I couldn't help but sort of twig to Adrian's comment where he said, you know, you break the barrier. So I thought, I'm going to talk about something that I have absolutely no expertise in. And if I fumble and stumble, please either help me <laughs> or, or bear with me. And it's really about w philosophy of life. I uh, don't profess to be a sort of a practitioner of Buddha, but being brought up a Roman Catholic, nice Italian boy that spent 18 years on the altar, this concept of Buddhism that talks about harmony with nature, which is more in keeping with what I do in growing grapes and tilling the soil, than that sort of strong dogma that I really became to resent over the years because it was about fear and punishment and all those kinds of things. So I'm going to try and actually get into a little bit of that philosophy of life and how experiences are for me. And I suppose ask myself, and maybe you've asked yourselves the question, particularly those of us that have sort of reached this so-called age of wisdom at 50. Um, just show of hands, how many of you are 50 or older? Put your hand up. So anybody under 50, you can just tune off and do something else. <laughs> Before I do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually, because I'm supposed to be talking about what I'm passionate about, what I do, what I, what I love. And I'm going to show a little clip, a little DVD that I did. My hobby is technology. So I actually put this thing together. So excuse the editing, but it's really just to tell you a little bit about what I do and about ice wine and so on. And then when I come back, I'm going to try to get into this other area and read you a little something and then play with it and see, uh, see where we go with it. Jack, if you could run that little piece. Donald Zidaldo has built a career from bringing together old and new ways. The eldest child of immigrants from the Friuli region of Italy, Zidaldo was formally trained in agricultural science, but proudly says his love of wine and grapes comes from his family. His Inniskillen wines have received some of the most prestigious winemaking awards in the world. This is Donald Zidaldo. I grew up on the farm, and my dad died. I was 14 years old. I had two younger brothers, and my mom 
took over the business, which is running the family farm. Nobody was paying much attention to us, saying, oh, these crazy guys down there making wine, they must be crazy. He said, you know, Donald, you know, being Italian, you know, you're going to run into things like prejudice and racism, and I didn't get it. And, you know, I still don't get it. A man passionate about wine, food, and the good life. In the tasting room, the big center table is Canadian maple. The lamps hanging above it are reproductions of Frank Lloyd Wright designs. Wright, an architect and designer who emerged from the Art Deco movement of the 1920s, is a strong design influence on Zeraldo. These chairs, which, by the way, are extremely uncomfortable to sit in, are reproduction Frank Lloyd Wrights. I'd love to buy the originals. I think they're about 150,000 each, <laughs> so it's a little bit out of our budget range. And they'd be museum pieces, so they'd be in a glass box. But these are functional, and they sort of convey the image. But the design comes, I mean, the bottle. You know, I mean, this is not your average bottle. It's from Italy, another Italian influence. So, you know, it's the elegance, the, 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 the presence that the bottle creates. The first one we had, which I'll show you, the 1989, was looked like a little stubby beer bottle. Kind of Canadian, but not kind of the image we want to create for ice wine. They took the desire for good design a step further with the creation of the ice wine glass. Whether it's the bottle or whether it's this, it's got to be function and design. And sometimes, like these handmade ice wine bottles, form is the most important thing. But when you pass through the limestone arches into the barrel cellar proper, it's all about function. Zeraldo keeps his dusty, prized possessions. Signed bottles from Chateau and Pomerol, or Ikem, famous French wineries. I collect wines with signature, and this particular one, I miss the opportunity, but you know, that happens. The Mouton Rothschild, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, commissions a artist every year, and they've had Picasso, they've had Dali, they've had all the world's greats. In 1978, the uh, Baron Philippe Rothschild selected Ria Pell, our great Canadian artist. Yeah. And what's interesting is there are actually... Oh, each, lab each label's different. Well, he, what he did was Ria Pell presented the, the Baron with two, and he said, pick one. The Baron couldn't decide, so every case has six bottles of one and six bottles of the other. Sadly, the Ria Pell signature is one that got away. The artist died only a few weeks ago with the ice wine, these are the ice wine grapes, and the normal harvest would take place between mid-September till the end of October. And in the case of the ice wine, we'd leave the grapes, so these clusters would be hanging here, the leaves all fall off, and then about mid-November, we cover the entire canopy, the grapes, with netting to keep the birds away. The grapes stay on the vine, and we pick them in November, and uh, they're frozen solid at minus 10, minus 12 Celsius. We cover the vine with netting to keep the birds out because the birds will devour everything. And then the grapes stay on the vine and the th freezing and thawing concentrates them. But when the temperature drops to minus 10 or minus 12, all of the water in the berry separates. What's left over is sugar, acid, and the flavor profile. And that's where you got the fantastic, luscious flavor. We go out and pick these grapes. It's a little chilly. The picking uh, goes all night through till 6 o'clock in the morning, and then it goes inside for fermenting, just like normal. The Olympics of wine world take place at Vin Expo. In 1991, with our 89 ice wine from Inniskillen, we won the Grand Prix d'Honneur. And it was like the French blessing us and saying, you've made the best dessert wine in the world. And the world picked up on this. And we'd been making ice wine before, but I tell you, that was like, as Sylvia Kaiser said, it was like winning the Academy Awards and the Olympics all at the same time. When he's not jetting off to international events and galas, indulging his passion for theater and the arts, or being Canada's ice wine ambassador, Zidaldo can be found on the ski slopes, relaxing with friends and family. Today, Ziraldo continues to travel exploring new ways to improve wines that some consider perfect already. He's done such extraordinary things, and I think that most uh, uh, Italians that have come to this country have worked hard because they like to work hard, and because of that, they've achieved what they've achieved. And if you look around now, you know, there's senators, uh, you know, they built Toronto, and they represent a real cultural diversity to Canada that I think is part and parcel of that. You've got French Canadian and English Canadian, and you know, 
maybe the solution is to drop that whole discussion about Anglophone and Francophone and do what the Italians do, just become Canadian, do what you do well, and add that cultural experience to Canada and forget all this nonsense about arguing about who we are and where we're going and stop acting like we're maybe a little British and maybe French and just be Canadian. So I thought that was very un-Canadian of me to be boasting, so I did it through the, uh, through the DVD. <laughs> the, um, delving into this other area, let me read something to you. And I couldn't memorize it, so I'm going to read it. It's by a guy named Viktor Frankl, and it's from Man's Search for Meaning. Man's search for meaning is the primary motivation in his life and not a secondary rationalization of instinctual drives. This meaning is unique and specific in that it must and can be fulfilled by him alone, him and her alone. Only then does it achieve a significance which will satisfy his, her own will to meaning. In, I'll, I'll give you two examples of my own present situation where I'm kind of stepping outside of the bottom line and looking at the business of, the, of what I do even though what I do is not so bad. I mean, you can see from this, and people have this great misconception that the business I'm in isn't really work. You know, we go for dinner all the time, we taste wines, I travel around the world and pour wine to people. It's not, not so bad. I could keep doing that, or maybe I need to look at something else. So one of the things that has become right now my mission in life is that, you know, the little area called the Niagara Peninsula, I'm trying to have the peninsula on and below the escarpment declared an agricultural preserve. And it's not an ingenious idea, because Napa Valley has that distinction in you all, or some of you know how magnificent it is. The Burgundy region, all the wine regions in, in the world have it. And to me, it's become really fundamental, but it's been a great learning experience, because it has no bottom line other than to preserve something that we think is a, a jewel in Canada. And yet, I'm amazed at, between the 13 municipalities in the region, the politicians who have really no commitment to anything that they can't get some benefit from, just to do it. And I've been working at it for two years, and it keeps slipping away, but I keep staying focused on it. I mean, the highway, uh, an extension of the 407 to take it above the escarpment has been, in principle, announced. But to actually make it happen and declare the uh, peninsula preserved, because you'd have to stop development. And the developers wouldn't be very happy, even though we have a, a plan to take it all above in the Welland, Port Coburn area, where there's certainly a need for business development and a community development. But look at it as a vision. I, I was at the Guggenheim recently and was looking at the Brazil exhibit. And the t city or town of Brasilia was designed completely as a new concept. You know, why don't we just do that in Niagara, turn the QEW into a bicycle path instead of that mess that it is right now where you see factories and these ridiculous walls of concrete for some reason that blocks the view of the lake because there's two houses in behind it. So th that's one of the aspects. The second thing that I created was a charity called Murals of Hope, and it was very much an accident. And you can appreciate being in the wine business, I get asked for wine a lot. Some of you may be guilty of it yourselves. You can call up, having a dinner for charity, call Donald, he'll take care of it. And we did that for many years because we want to support the charities, support the arts, and in any way we can. But it got to the point, and it was what a small coincidence during the ice wine harvest, uh, we do a celebrity ice wine picking as a fundraising. And the guys you saw up there from Bare Naked Ladies were there. And a lady, a young lady, a uh, mother, came and said she wanted me to help paint a mural in a hospital, and I was really trying to avoid the discussion, but my assistant, who I trust dearly, said, Donald, really listen to her story. And what had happened was when I said, come to the uh, celebrity ice wine picking, because then I've got five minutes to sort of talk to you, but really just talk to you, and then I'll get rid of you. She brought a picture of her son, who had had a head injury, and he painted this monster, and it was really his pain that he was suffering in the hospital. So she was painting, as an artist, this mural to relieve some of the pain, soothe some of the pain. Told me this, I, uh, she also had a craft dinner box, which some of you get the joke about, if I had a million dollars, there's a craft dinner box story in there, so. She wanted Steve to sign it, so, which we did. So I invited her to lunch, said, come and stay and you have lunch. And for some reason, when I stood up and talked to everybody at the luncheon after we'd done the ice wine picking and so on and so forth, I said, and this is, Sean Frost, and we are going to start a charity for 
children, and we're going to paint murals at hospitals and orphanages. And I've gotten so much satisfaction out of that, and I spent a lot of time at it. And without trying to publicize, it's probably the first time it's been mentioned publicly, because it's just something that satisfies me as opposed to being driven by this whole situation of being successful and making sure we get on TV as much as we can to publicize the, the brand. But it's a platform, and that's what I've discovered is that the success I've had within a skill and is the platform that I can then use to do the kinds of things that, that I hope to do. Um, on the way back from this trip where I finished reading this um, Awakening the Buddha and got a little bit inspired, I picked up, and probably a meaningful coincidence, I picked up this book called Spiritual Intelligence. This is called The Ultimate Intelligence by Dana Zor. And it's difficult to read. It took me a long time. Thank goodness for a 16-hour flight back home because I got to spend time reading it. And I'm going to try and touch on some of the aspects of it. But in principle, what it talks about is the fact that our intelligence is coded in our genome. And it starts to play with this whole aspect of where we come from and you know, how we get spiritual and the creativity. There's three types of intelligence. Basically, there's the IQ, which we're all familiar with. We've taken the tests or, or should have taken the tests. And it's our sort of logical, um, idea-bound thinking that we're fairly familiar with. You took IQ tests. Computers can do it uh, through serial processing. Matter of fact, they probably do it better than we do and do it faster than we do. The second one is emotional uh, intelligence, and a guy named Daniel Goodman, I think, is the author who spoke about it, wrote about it a lot recently in the last you know, 10, 20 years. And that's the associative thinking. It's how we put our thoughts together, uh, the ability to put thoughts in order, think about those kinds of things. Um, Pavlov, the Russian scientist Pavlov, the dog, so on and so forth. That's that aspect. Then there's this third element that talks about here as spiritual intelligence, and, and that's the creative element. And I'm assuming that there, if you were going to measure those three in here, that there would be a very high level of creative spiritual intelligence to the group because you're all here to learn something. We're not sure what we came for, but we came here to share each other's ideas. So as I was reading this, it, it sort of touched on the idea that the first two aspects machines can do because even in the uh, emotional uh, intelligence, machines can now talk to each other and process information and come out with uh, process thinking. I'm not quite sure what the term is. But the spiritual intelligence leads us into the consciousness. This book talks about an aspect of our brain that with the ability in the 90s to measure electromagnetic activity of the brain, you can actually identify this 40 HZ oscillations. Don't ask me what they are, maybe somebody could explain it. And it talks about the fact that that is what really starts to create our consciousness. And it talks quantum theory. Now, I don't know anything about quantum theory, but it sounds very intriguing, and it begins to explain, and I'm actually probably gonna have to read that little aspect of it, um, but better than do that, I'm, I'm gonna suggest maybe Moses that before I fall here on my face in this, philosophy is maybe next year we invite Dana Zonar and Ian Marshall to talk to us about it because I think it's something fundamental. And it talks in the book about Buddhism relating to that aspect of, of spirituality, the mantras that are used for meditating, and it ties it all in way beyond my uh, capacity to, to explain it to you. I'm collecting my thoughts because I may have, uh, did, did any of you get some of that or did it make any sense? <laughs> Because here I thought I had it all planned, and it's only about um, 300 pages, and I just condensed it back into about 25 words. L let me finish then with a little anecdote that maybe makes a little fun of it and puts it all in perspective. And it's uh, about a businessman sitting on a dock in Mexico, and this fisherman comes in. And the businessman who's on vacation sort of compliments this fisherman and says, it's a wonderful catch you had today. And uh, how long did you sort of spend out there fishing? And the um, fisherman said, oh, not long, senor. He said, I um, had a small catch, and that was sufficient to feed my family. And the businessman said, well, you know, you, I think I could help you. He said, because um, you know, I've got an MBA, and you and I could really do something. 
And he says, but you know, what did you do with the rest of the day when you finished fishing? He said, well, he said, Senor, he said, I uh, sleep late. He said, I uh, go into town, see my friends, have a little siesta with my wife, go down and play the guitar with my amigos. So he says, I have a very busy, full life, Senor. So the businessman says, well, you know, he says, I think, I think we're on something. I think I can help you. He said, we could fish a lot longer, catch a lot more fish, maybe buy a fleet of boats. Then you could get rid of the middleman and process the fish. But he said, you might have to move to a big city because you're going to end up with running a big business. And the fisherman said, well, like, how long is that going to take, senor? 15, 20 years. He said, you know, that's normal time for a business to begin. And he says, oh, that's uh, very interesting. He says, then what? And the business, well, that's the best part. He said, this is the real, the real key. He said, then he said, when you become very rich and successful, he said, you can sell all your stock in the business, retire, move to a small village, <laughs> have a siesta with your wife, etc. Et Thank you very much. When Don mentioned that uh, we had discussed a little wine tasting, I noticed there was a gasp of expectation. <laughs> and then perhaps a little sigh of disappointment when it looked as if he wasn't going to do it, but we are, in fact. Uh, Don has graciously provided um, hundreds of bottles, little ones, of ice wine, which are cooling outside. Uh, and uh, after we hear our next and last speaker, it'll all be waiting for you as you go out to lunch.